The normal type is just that, plain. But it is the type of my overall favorite Pokemon, Dunsparce. It's the best. And aside from Dunsparce, there's lots of great normal types, and I'd love to hear your favorite down in the comments below. And luckily, Pokemon Legends Arceus is a great selection, lots of which are some of the new ones. So how exactly do I hardcore Nuzlocke Legends? Simple, any Pokemon that faints is boxed forever. No items can be used in battle, and my level limit is the highest level fight in each area. I'm also only allowed to capture one Pokemon from each normal type evolution line. So join me as I attempt to beat a Pokemon Legends Arceus hardcore Nuzlocke using only normal types. And fortunately, our journey gives us access to two normal types right away, being the fabled Bidoof and its neighbor, Starly. I swear that if Nintendo makes me wear this hat one more time, they'll regret that they made the Switch such a throwable console. Anyway, meet Lima in London, they're very cute. And the cuteness doesn't stop there, because I very quickly found myself an Eevee. And just like that, we find ourselves in the first battle of the challenge. And the battle system in this game is actually very different from the main series and can be quite unforgiving. And even in the early game, since the Pokemon have pretty inflated stats for being such low level, can be very hard. However, a couple of tackles from the legendary Bidoof and we've dealt with Akari. Wait a second, Maya's a Munchlax? I need you! Not only is the Munchlax the source of my jealousy, but it's also the source of Mai's power. And since Starly gets absolutely one-shot by a rollout from this thing, it's not an option. And just when Eevee gets to the amount of HP where I have to swap out, I see that using Quick Attack lets me use two moves in a row, so I use one Quick Attack and then swap out. Using the speed-based turn system to your advantage is pretty much the only viable strategy to get through this game. I think this makes the speed stat even more overpowered than it is in the regular games, but we managed to get through this fight with both of our mons in the red. Pressing on, I find myself an antlery boy and a welcome addition to the team, Stantler. That's right, next up is Alpha Cricketune, and we do have the Starly to deal with this thing, but unfortunately it always goes for a move first. So I opt to go for Oslo first to get in a tackle before I have to switch out since it gets really low, but unfortunately Starly takes a huge amount of damage on switch in. I do a bit of messing around with the different styles and see that using Agile Style Gust lets me move again right afterwards, which means that Aerial Ace is enough to take it out and we don't have to lose any Pokemon. You know, a Game Freak Lax and Hat style they really make up for in Antlers. Adam and Anirita bickering all the time is so annoying. We get it, just kiss already. At level 14, our first Pokemon to evolve is Lima into Staravia. Hey, I didn't know they put Schlatt in this game. Moving on, our missions to quell the frenzied Cleavor, and on my way, I managed to pick up a Baneri. I then have a quick run-in with Leon, who's never seen a Swedish person before. So he challenges us to a battle with his pathetic Gumi that gets absolutely destroyed in two tackles, but I'm really less worried about him and more worried about Iridus Glaceon. Once aboard my antlery vehicle of choice, I have my eyes set on a Munchlax. Because of the fact that I have to face this Glaceon that could potentially tear through my team, my plan is to try and get myself a Snorlax. And trust me, grinding friendship in this game is not a great time. You just have to break rock, after rock, after rock, and slap the ever-living heck out of those berry trees until you finally get the right to evolve. But the sweet reward is certainly worth it now that we have the chunkiest boy, and even a bee barrel to boot. And all this just to make this fight against Glaceon as smooth as possible. Because of Snorlax's god-tier special defense, Swift barely does any damage, so a couple of rock smashes is enough and it gets us through the very first area. Well, I say that, but we do of course have to deal with the frenzied Cleavor. However, against the frenzy fights, you don't actually ever have to send your Pokemon in, and it would be very, very stupid since they're pretty strong and I don't want to lose any. But before before we leave the Obsidian Fieldlands, I decide to go to the Orberg Tunnel to try and get myself a Hapini. Ah, what a beautiful morning. Where to, Professor Laventon? Hold on a second, we're going to the swamp? I didn't sign up for this, what the fuck? Anyway, our stay in the swamp offers us a chance at a lot of new normal types. And since I pretty much immediately found myself in a space-time distortion where you can find the rare Porygon, I was pretty excited, but turns out I didn't find a single Porygon. On the plus side, I did find a dubious disc, but the whole experience was pretty disappointing. And with a grand leap of faith, we make it to the other side. Okay, just barely, Just we just gotta go uh, walk up to show... Okay, yep, help, I, I'm drowning, yep. After drying off and seeing a therapist, I find myself a Lickitung, and right as I catch it, a new space-time distortion formed. And so, after biding my time during this second space-time distortion, I get the over 80% chance to find a Porygon. I even manage to capture it and find myself an upgrade for my troubles. Which means that not only can we get a Porygon 2 right after catching this thing, since we also have the dubious disc, I get myself a Porygon Z. At this 
point, the story takes us to the Salacion Ruins, known for the unknown, and here we have to face our next opponent, Volo. He starts the fight with his Togepi, so I go ahead and send in our newest member of the team, Zagreb the Porygon Z, who immediately blasts this thing out of existence with a stab try attack, meaning we have to face Gibble, who moves first and hits with an agile style bulldoze. This actually lets Gibble move again and hits us down to pretty low HP, so I decide to swap out of Zagreb into Washington the Licky Tongue. And after tanking a twister, a quad effective Ice Ball is enough to end the fight. This means we gotta go and retrieve this lost wall fragment from the three least likable characters in all of Pokemon. These guys show up way too often and they're never welcome, but the first one we have to take on is Coin and her Toxicroak, which could be a big problem for our normal types. Or rather, it would be a problem if Oslo wasn't a speed demon that could Psy Shield bash this thing out of existence faster than I can finish this sentence. And with the wall fragment restored, Kalaba asks us to help Ursaluna. I'll admit I didn't expect anybody else to truly care for Ursaluna. What do you mean? It's a normal type! Of course I care! And speaking of the bear, I managed to capture myself a Teddy Ursa, but it's got a horrible nature with minus speed. I'd also at this point got my hands on an Oval Stone, which means we can evolve Sophia into a Chansey. And thus we have to face our first real dangerous fight of the run, Ursa Luna. I start off with a Water Pulse, but a Slash does way too much damage to London, so I have to swap out into Wellington. A Baby Doll Eyes lowers Welly's attack, but I retaliate the next turn with an Ice Ball, which does pretty minimal damage. I then manage to dodge the Slash, but I miss my next Ice Ball, so I get hit by the Slash anyway. I decide to risk the crit and go for another Ice Ball, but it doesn't do as much damage as I wanted, and even though it misses the Slash, I decide to swap out a Welly into Zagreb. It turns out that PZ actually gets to move first when it comes out, so a dry attack is enough to just finish the fight. I then decide to use the Ursaluna Ride Pokemon to look for a Peat Block in the bog. This is the only way we're going to be able to evolve Ursa Ring later on into an Ursaluna of our own, but this took way too long. I spent probably two hours of my life getting dud after dud after dud until we finally managed to get the Peat Block. Okay, why does this one line up exactly perfectly to make it look like Lickitung's crying? I mean, Lickitung should be crying, it's an abomination, but it's still funny. Then after gathering some more materials, I realize that my Chansey can finally evolve into a Blissey. Which takes us to Lilligant, the easiest of the Frenzy Pokemon, which once again, I handle without having to send in a single Pokemon. And just before heading to the beach, I evolve Buneary into a Lopunny. You may be on the team, but you're not part of the family. Onwards to the Cobalt Coastlands, and hey, the layout back. So any questions before you get started? Listen, I know this is for the Mississippi centerfold, but do I have to wear a bikini? Yes. Once here in the coastlands, we get introduced to something this game likes to do a lot, and that's battles where you face multiple opponents. And this time, it's Irida and her Glaceon and Eevee, which are very fast, but we do end up doing a lot of damage with Iron Head before taking an Ice Beam. A second Iron Head does the trick, and the low-level Eevee doesn't stand a chance. Now that I'm free to explore the beach, I immediately set eyes on a Glammeow and capture it. We then meet Polina, and girl, why are your knees so scuffed up? I then also happen to encounter an Ambipom, but being at level 39, we're not going to be using this guy anytime soon. Iskan, the Hairless and Fearless, asks us to capture a Dusclops. So I then make my way oh, hold on, okay, I guess we can't, uh, oh no, just give me a minute as I drown in this knee-high water. As I was saying, we catch a Dusclops, which like, ew, not a normal type. Iskan, you're supposed to be the Fearless, what's going on? Oh, it's just the Hairless? And while he may be afraid of Dusclops, he's not afraid of love. But seriously guys, you met me five minutes ago, like maybe don't share your illegal secrets. It's no secret, however, that the misfortunes are really annoying for stealing Growlithe. So of course it falls to me to scale a volcano, and after doing a bit of grinding, Teddy Ursa can finally evolve. But not only can we evolve this thing into an Ursa Ring, since we did all that grinding to get a peat block, we can go through the tedious process of grinding out nights until it's a full moon, at which point we can finally evolve into an Ursa Luna. And trust me guys, I have no prior experience using this thing, but it is an absolute monster! And while I was doing preparations, I decided it was time to evolve Stantler, to do which you have to use Psy Shield Bash in Agile Style 20 times. But as soon as that's done, we can evolve it into the best boy, the Antler Boy. Staravi also evolves into Staraptor, and look at this team, it's stacked! Which is gonna be absolutely necessary, since at this point we have to take on the Misfortune Gauntlet, facing all three sisters in succession with no breaks. I start the fight by using an Agile Style Psy Shield Bash to boost my defense against the Obama Snow that hits me with an Energy Ball. I then manage to connect with an Iron Tail, taking out the Obama Snow, which means we face Coin and her Toxicroak. 
Since Oslo was faster last time, I'm not particularly worried about it, and I take it out with a strong style Psy Shield Bash. This leaves only the eldest of the sisters, Charm, who starts out with a Rhydon. With no choice in the matter, I again start with Oslo and go for an Agile style Psy Shield Bash. This gives me a bit of extra survivability as I get hit by a Bulldoze, but the next turn I miss my Psy Shield Bash. Not only that, my defense returns to normal as an Agile style Bulldoze hits me pretty hard and it gets to move again to take me down into the red. Obviously at this point I have to swap out going into Zagreb who gets to move first and takes out the Rhydon with an Icy Wind. This means we have to face Charm's strongest Pokemon Gengar who immediately puts Zagreb to sleep so I decide to swap out into Wellington. With Snorlax's massive special defense, tanking a few Venoshocks isn't a problem whatsoever, and a couple of fire punches does the trick. I'm pretty happy we got through that one without any casualties. Tiny then decides to blast these fools into oblivion, evolving into an Arcanine. That's one point for the good guys. Oh, my bad. Scratch that. That's one for the bad guys. Quelling the Frenzy is of course a problem we don't have to face with our Pokemon, which I'm pretty relieved about. My final order of business on the beach is capturing a Chatot. We then meet Melly, who's probably the rudest guy in all of Pokemon. Like, you don't get to be this rude if Smelly Melly is that accessible an insult. Anyway, Professor Broen sends us off to the Coronet Highlands, but first we have to face Adamant in battle. And similar to Irida, he's got a Leafy on an Eevee, which is a problem for him because we've got Staraptor. We then meet Ingo, who used to be a boss on the black and white battle subway, and this guy loves to make train puns. And speaking from experience as a guy who's worked as a tram conductor, some people are way too into trains. I like trains. While in the Highlands, we learn that Melly has removed all the torches in the cave to have us killed by Alpha Crobat. So of course we confront him about this, and he faces us with his skun tank. However, this time, we've got Ursa Luna, and remember how I told you this thing is a monster? We just get to use Bulldoze twice and absolutely steamroll this thing. But that's not all. After hearing Ingo spout more of his train lingo, it's time to face him in one of the most scary battles in the game. This is one of the more absurd difficulty spikes in the game, as his Gly score is super fast. But he starts out with his Machoke, and I go for Lima, hitting this thing immediately with an Aerial Ace, which doesn't quite take it out, but it uses Double Edge and takes itself out with Recoil. In comes Tangela, and not wanting to be hit by a potential Ancient Power, I decide to swap out into Monaco. Seeing that I actually get a free move here, I decide to go for the Ice Punch, and I end up getting the Frostbite, which lowers its special attack by half. Then getting hit by a Stun Spore, I see this as the perfect opportunity to swap out into Snorlax. My best bet against Gliscor is definitely going to be Snorlax, who's been an absolute boss this entire run, and after Tangela goes down to the Frostbite, Wellington actually gets to move first and almost one-shots the Gliscor as it then proceeds to go for two moves, after which I can just take it out, so that really wasn't as bad as I was expecting. You know, I may never get used to Sneasler's design, but being carried on this thing's back in a basket is the funniest thing in the entire game. Before I can take on the Frenzy Pokemon, Melly decides he hasn't had enough of losing and challenges me again, but this time with three Pokemon instead of one. And on top of that, I accidentally lead with Oslo instead of Soul. And an immediate Night Slash that almost takes me out means I have to switch out right away. Fortunately, Skorupi decides to not move, and the Zubat misses a Hypnosis, which means we only have to eat a Night Slash. Using my Agile-style Bulldoze means I get to move again before Skuntank, and the other Pokemon just decide to not move so I can freely take it out. I then proceed to exterminate them, which means we've defeated Melly once and for all. I didn't lose. You may have won, but there's a difference. Yeah, you keep telling yourself that, loser. Our next frenzy challenge is Electrode, and this thing takes a long time to just run around and try and throw bombs, but eventually we gain its trust too. Melly then has an absolute meltdown. I arrive right on schedule. Dude, one more train pun and I will go off the rails on your ass. Does anyone else playing this game really want to try Potato Mochi? Like, we don't have that in Sweden. I mean, just look at this team. We got Weird here, Ursa Luna, Porygon Z, Snorlax, Lickitung is here. And we don't talk about low punny. I mean, who wouldn't want to join this chill sesh? Oh, and admittedly, I had no idea that you could just evolve Licka Licky if you had rollout on it. Oops. Ew. I also evolved Glammeow into Per Ugly before making the biggest fatal mistake of the run. I teleport to the front gate to get some of my Pokemon in order to do some grinding, but that puts me immediately into a battle with Akari. And this battle really shouldn't be difficult in the slightest, except for the fact that I have all my best Pokemon boxed. So she leads with Mr. Mime as I send in Washington. She outspeeds being four levels higher than me, hits me with a Psychic, so I have to swap out to Sophia, who can hopefully tank these hits a bit better. On the switch, Mr. Mime goes for a Calm Mind, boosting its attack and defense stats, but I get to retaliate with a Shadow Ball that does more than half damage. Mr. Mime then 
and makes me drowsy with hypnosis, and I can't move the next turn, so it hits me with an agile-style psychic to do about a quarter of damage. Another psychic puts me below half, but I can't risk switching into anything, and a shadow ball actually connects and takes out the Mr. Mime. And unfortunately, since the Staravia gets to move as soon as it comes in, this means the end of Sophia and our Deathless streak. Fortunately, Ambipom, who I never even had time to give a nickname because it's his first fight, can take it out with a Thunder Punch, and in comes Pikachu. Iron Tail does massive damage as I hit it with an Agile-style Quick Attack, which lets me move again, and I thought Strong Style would take it out, but it lives on just a sliver and takes out Ambipom too. This does mean that Oslo is going to get to move as soon as it comes in and can take out the Pikachu with Bulldoze to end this massacre, but that was definitely not a great fight for us. And putting our first great loss behind us, we make our way to the Alabaster Icelands. Here I immediately make a beeline for the place where I can find myself, Hisui and Zorua. You're so precious. I also managed to catch a Rufflet, but since it loses its normal type when it evolves into a Sui and Braviary, it's gonna be pretty useless. And so after just a bit of grinding, my favorite Pokemon from the newest games evolves into Hisui and Zoroark. And we're then introduced to Garrick, who definitely looks like one of those guys who runs in only shorts during winter. And to move on, we of course have to beat him in a battle, so I send in Monaco, who immediately gets missed by an icicle crash. Rosslass then hits me with a powder snow that gives me frostbite, but luckily I'm a physical attacker and can take out that Frostlass with a Fire Punch. Glalie then actually hits its powerful Icicle Crash, which does way more damage than I expected, so I decide to swap out into Wellington. And Welly, being a massive glutton, can eat Icicles for days, hit back with a Fire Punch that burns the Glalie, which means that this Ice Shard does barely any damage. Then after one more round of Icicles, we can take him out with a final Fire Punch, beating Garrick. Which means we have to move on to Snowpoint Temple. And here we've got another really tough opponent to take on in this game. She's got Rhyperior, Electivire, and Magmortar to face us with. I figure that my best and possibly only shot at this is using Ursa Luna, and I hit the Rhyperior with a powerful high horsepower. It then hits back with a high horsepower of its own that does about a quarter of my health. A Thunder Wave does nothing, of course, but because of Agile Style, I get hit again down to low health and can take it out with another high horsepower. I then expect to get KO'd by a flamethrower since soul has done its job, but it actually just goes for poison gas, which means I can take out the Magmortar the next turn. This right here pretty much guarantees my win, since Electivire seemingly can't hit me with any moves, so I just slap it with a headlong rush for the victory. But dumb as I am, I didn't heal or take Ursaluna out of the lead against Braviary, so it could just take me out, but it goes for Roost with full HP. It is by some insane stroke of luck that Ursa Luna is still alive, but we switch to Washington, who tanks a Brave Bird, who can then retaliate with a double edge. Not wanting to miss and get KO'd here, I swap out into Tokyo. And Zoroark actually gets to move right away, so a strong style Bitter Malice ends the Braviary. We then take flight towards our next objective. Yo, Eternal Ice, that sounds like an edgy high school band. And our next objective is to quell the Frenzied Avalug. And seeing as this is one of the easiest Frenzy fights in the entire game, it doesn't give me much trouble at all. For your epic antics, you are banished. Excuse me, what? Akari, I know you never liked me, but play it down a little bit. And so Miss Unova wanders the land, a lonely but stylish outcast. If only there were a way to feel better about this utter tragedy. We should fight some alphas. That's right, to gain the favor of the late trio, we have to take on three alphas. And first is Gudra, who I didn't expect to outspeed and almost take me out with a hydro pump, but an agile-style headlong rush lets us move again and take it out with another one. Second up is Zorwark, so naturally I send in Welly. Immediately, the Zorwark hits us with a snarl, but because of that big special defense, it's not a big deal, and I hit it with an agile-style crunch. But my efforts to try and stop this thing from hitting me twice go totally unrewarded as I get hit by snarl. I then try a strong style crunch to see if I can take it out, but it just barely survives and sets up a nasty plot. And since I went for strong style, it gets a second move, but by using agile style, it even gets a third and takes me down to just 43 HP. Luckily at this point, we actually get to make a move and Snorlax sticks around on the team, taking out the Zoroark, leaving only Overquill, and I expected to be faster than this thing, so we once again get slapped with a powerful Aqua Tail that doesn't quite take us out, and a strong style headlong rush does the trick. And defeating these three means we obtain the ridiculous red chain. Lucario, please spare my normal types. We've almost made our way to the peak of Mount Coronet. And upon us are some of the most difficult battles that this game has to offer. First of all, Benny. Because as much as we all like to hate on Sneasler, it's definitely a threat in this game. 
Benny starts with Miss Magius as I go into Welly, who gets hit by a power gem for basically no damage at all as I freely take it out with a crunch. Short term, this is great, but long term, not so excellent, says Sneasler gets to move twice and take us out with a close combat, which means the end of Wellington. Fortunately though, Sneasler's quad weak to Psychic, so we can Psy Shield bash its face in. Predictably, since Benny looks like Wally, his next Pokemon is Gardevoir that hits us with a dazzling gleam, but since we got that defense boost, we basically take no damage and take it out with an Iron Tail. Gallade starts out strong with a Swords Dance, which is incredibly scary as I put it to sleep with Hypnosis. Gallade's then too drowsy to move, so a Psy Shield Bash does massive damage as it boosts our defenses back. Benny then goes for a Max Potion as a Bash takes it down to low health again, and a Drain Punch gets him back to about half health as we can take it out with another Psy Shield Bash. It didn't turn out so well for Welly, but at least we got the value out of that Snorlax. We now ascend towards the summit, but first we have to take on Commander Komodo himself. And this guy honestly has a pretty scary team. Starting out with Hisui and Braviary, I lead with Licky Licky. Losing our best special tanks in Blissey and Snorlax is definitely a detriment since this air slash hits us hard. We do manage to make up for our lack of special defenders by getting Frostbite and another Ice Punch seals the deal. Once again, taking something out against trainers who have multiple Pokemon in this game is a double-edged sword since you're probably going to be on the receiving end of something like a Giga Impact. On the flip side though, since Snorlax took out Licky Licky, we get to switch in Monaco and just use two moves in a row and take it out with a couple of close combats. And I gotta say, if they included more trainers with 4 plus Pokemon of varying types, it would be very difficult to Nuzlocke through this game. Because what ends up happening is since Pokemon do so much damage in this game, the Pokemon that comes in just takes out whatever you had on the field, kinda like my Lopunny. I send in Star Raptor here, and it doesn't quite take out the Golem with a close combat, but an Agile style click attack is enough. The reason I went Agile is because I don't want to give this incoming Clefairy too much speed on me. It does end up hitting me down to 3 HP with a Psychic, so I have to swap out into Oslo. I end up going for an Agile Psy Shield Bash to boost my defenses as it then hits me with its own Agile move, but it just ends up being a baby doll eyes and then it hits me with a draining kiss to get back minimal HP. I then of course miss an Iron Tail as my defensive stats get lowered and the Clefable boosts itself with a Calm Mind. I then miss yet another move as the Clefable draining kisses me down below half HP and gets back to full. Thinking it's over for Oslo here, I go for an Agile Psy Shield Bash just to get my defenses back up so a draining kiss doesn't take me out. I then miss another Iron Tail as my stats get restored to neutral, but I get to move again and I hit it down to about 30% HP. Komodo then full restores, but his stats get neutralized and because of that, one Iron Tail is enough to take out the Clefable and win us the fight. I didn't expect to get to keep Oslo, but he's a real hero. After Komodo admits he was wrong for banishing us, we really only have one challenge before us, and that is Dialga. You see, normally you just have to catch this thing, but since we're doing normal types only, I figure we gotta defeat this thing in battle. And I start off by sending in Lima since I know it's gonna be faster and I can hit it hard with a super effective close combat. Unfortunately, this means that it's gonna be erased from the timeline by Dialga, but it's a small price to pay in order to send in Soul to take this home. All I have to do is click Strong Style Headstrong Rush to guarantee my victory. And that's how I beat a Pokemon Legends Arceus Hardcore Nuzlocke using only normal types. I mean, yeah, theoretically, there is one more trainer fight in the game. But seeing as she's so much easier than both Komodo and Benny, it's not even worth considering part of the Nuzlocke. Once that fight's over, there's of course the fight with Palkia, but much like any other Frenzy fight, we don't have to send in a Pokemon ever, so I personally consider the end of the first Dialgar Palkia fight the final fight of the Nuzlocke. So let me know what you guys thought of this little experiment. Nuzlocking this game is of course not like Nuzlocking a regular Pokemon game, and I would love to see in the comments below what you guys thought of it. You actually saw every single trainer fight in the entire game in this video. Nuzlocking this game is actually more grinding than it is Nuzlocking because there are so few trainers and you have to catch Pokemon to get to the next rank to progress to the next area. But that being said, I had a good time and I hope you guys had a good time too. And if you're not subscribed to the channel, what are you doing? Remember to leave a like, call your mother and clean your room or whatever. But until we see each other next time, have a good one. Now, oh, Palkia, what do they do to you? You need help. One like equals one prayer.